Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Jay Sola from Investors Alley. He's going to share with us a particular options trade that is uh, top of mind for him. Overall, the market's back in distribution mode after yesterday's bounce into the close. Today, we get the opposite, sort of rolling over, pushing on to the downside. This is on uh, a Fed meeting day. we got the minutes coming out uh, with, uh, with uh, an ability to think through some of that, potentially digesting some of those implications going into the close. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets using the language of technical analysis, behavioral finance, investor psychology, focusing on price and trend and momentum and breadth and sentiment, all the data points we can gather to make sense of what investors are thinking, where their expectations are, and how that's reflected in stock prices. As my mentors told me early on as I was learning the, uh, the craft of technical analysis was if you know nothing else about a stock, a company, a sector, look at the chart. The chart will tell you most of what you need to know to understand what people, what investors really are thinking, how they're voting with their capital, which is the most important thing to uh, pay attention to, arguably. And the market's back in a bit of a distribution mode. I was talking with my guest, uh, Jay Siloff, before we started. It, it feels a lot worse than it really looks. The S&P closing only down about 1%, but after this you know, continued uptrend for months and months, with every month making a new all-time high, a day like today feels severe. Boy, an actual correction with deeper moves is going to feel uh, a lot worse, if and when. I'm told at some point we will see one of those. Uh, not today quite yet. We have great guests on the show. Uh, Jay Sola from Investors Alley joining us here momentarily. Tomorrow on Thursday the 19th, we have Larry Berman from ETF Capital Management in Toronto. Coming up next week, three great guests for you on Tuesday the 24th. Author and trader Kathy Donnelly on Wednesday, the 25th, Katie Stockton from Fair Lead Strategies in Connecticut. And then on Thursday, joining us from Chicago, John Kosar from Asbury Research always does a great job of breaking down the macro environment from a technical perspective. Also, just a reminder, our next episode of The Pitch is coming up next week. For more information on that great series, we have three uh, experts so, uh, pitching their uh, ideas to you. Go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch. Continuing on today with our market recap, as I mentioned, the S&P sort of rolling over, hanging in there through much of the day. It was sort of a dribbling lower type of day, uh, but by the close, it really kind of came down. It reminded me of being in college or in high school when you know the bell is coming and you're kind of looking at the clock and cheering for it to kind of hit, right? Sort of cheering for the seconds to go by. I feel like the market is doing that going into the close today, you know, just desperate to get the uh, closing bell rung. Uh, to prevent further downside into uh, into the close. That last hour, last 30 to 40 minutes, usually indicates institutional uh, investors and what sort of moves they're making. Also could be ETFs and other things, uh, of course, but uh, for what it's worth, uh, indicating some uh, a downside bias going into the uh, into the close. So the S&P closing around 4,400. Uh, it's down about 1%. Mid caps and small caps actually outperformed by just a bit, but it pretty much everything was down uh, going into the close. The NASDAQ, same thing, sort of a rounding error away from the S&P. The, the VIX is actually back up above 20, even above 21, which is quite a swing up from you know just below 18 yesterday, if I remember right. Um, looking very quickly at some other asset classes, and we'll dig into uh, to some of the charts. Ten-year yields up a little bit, sort of chopped around, uh, but really not much to around 127 on the ten-year. Um, the uh, dollar index essentially flat uh, for the day by the close. Commodities overall uh, coming off, uh, although gold was up just a little bit, but, but basically flat for the day. Silver uh, going lower, and energy was by far the worst sector of the 11 S&P sectors today, down 2.2% using the XLE. Cryptos ended up being uh, mixed here. Uh, a lot of movement and all sort of in distribution mode in the last couple hours all rolling over. So Bitcoin had been up to around 46,000. It's already down uh, below 45,000 just in the in the last uh, couple hours here as we were preparing for the show. 
Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. So, you know, we've talked about this market being in what I've called a stealth correction. And, you know, if you measure certain things, we're going to dig into the breadth indicators here in a little bit. And I think if you look at some measures of breadth, things like the bullish percent indexes, things like the cumulative advanced decline lines, things like the percent of stocks above key moving averages, I would argue that a correction has been happening because plenty of stocks are already down 10, 20 plus percent, uh, depending on what group and what sectors, what, uh, what names you're looking at in particular. So while the average themselves have held up. They've been managing to do that because of a pretty clever rotation of leadership. There's been enough stocks that have uh, that have been able to take the reins and push things higher from cyclicals to tech and back and forth. And overall, it's been a net positive. A day like today reminds you that can also net out to uh, a negative. And that's what we're that's what we're kind of seeing here. Um, so the S&P has come quickly down from a new all time high on uh, Monday's uh, close above 44, 44.50, call 44.60. We've come down very quickly to uh, to 4,400. We're about halfway down to the 50-day moving average. That didn't take long. That took two days to uh, to uh, bridge the gap to the uh, to the 50-day. So a pullback to the 50-day would be very much a garden variety 2021 correction. That's what this year in uh, in correction form has been. It's been a four to five percent uh, correction to the 50-day after making a new all-time high, and then we resume the uptrend. Could this be the time? When that pattern is broken, I would I would say it is. I would say it most likely is. I've said it is before, and it's not played out. So I don't know. I don't know if I can have a huge amount of confidence in that. But I, I again, based on the weight of the evidence, I'm seeing plenty of things telling you that the uptrend is exhausted. Uh, I thought an interesting one uh, last week, by the way, uh, was or in the last really the two weeks, uh, the Demarc uh, countdown 13, which indicates trend exhaustion triggered the Friday before last. And then just yesterday, we had a price flip, which is a close lower than the close four bars ago. It's the first time we've actually had that. Uh, and that actually triggers a, a, a sell signal or confirms the sell signal that we got there uh, about a week and a half ago. So there are plenty of indications suggesting the market rolling over. As always, I think a diligent investor has a keen eye on uh, risk assessments or, or risk levels, right? Looking at what levels may be holding, what levels may be uh, breaking, and making sure that you uh, manage the downside risk. The charts will tell you when it's not the right time to own that particular chart anymore. Just make sure you, the goal, I think, or the biggest challenge is to actually following through with what the chart is telling you to do. The, the technical analysis is often the easy part. Actually doing what the chart is telling you is uh, is really key. Let's look at some of the sector uh, movements today. So we have consumer discretionary, the only one out of the 11 S&P sectors that actually finished in the green, which is an interesting one. I talked to you yesterday with my guest, um, uh, Sean McLaughlin, and we were talking about uh, retail, and he was suggesting that retail is potentially the biggest area of concern. The question is, is that going to be able to uh, hold support on a day like today when you have a, a lot of earnings this week, right? Things like TJX, Ross stores, Lowe's, all in the top 10 uh, you know, uh, movers in the S&P 500, uh, top 10 gainers, that is, in the S&P 500, certainly speaks to some underlying uh, uh, demand there, right? Some some opportunity for uh, for a bit of a bounce there. The question is, is that sustainable or not? I I, I think that's still an open question, uh, but obviously coming down, uh, coming off of some fairly beaten down levels for some of those names. Number two after consumer discretionary is utilities, which is interesting. And then we have communication services, number three. At the bottom of the list, energy, which is not a huge surprise given just the weakness that we've seen in those charts. You've seen a real rotation away from energy. A little later, we'll look at a particular breadth indicator, which indicates internal weakness in the energy sector. But today's downside move, not a huge surprise if you've been following the chart. Healthcare is an interesting one because uh, healthcare has certainly been a resilient sector out of the 11, where we've seen a lot of emerging strength, improvement in relative strength, uh, which has been fairly encouraging. And so giving back some of those recent gains um, today. As I mentioned, looking at the stocks gaining today, a couple names that I think are noteworthy. Lowe's going up almost 10% is a uh, is a significant one. Um, you know, and as we, uh, again, this has not been a super exciting chart. This has been a stock that just yesterday was breaking down through support. We always talk about when you break a support or resistance level, you look for follow through. And that is my, you know, very simple way of saying, once you break a level, do you continue, right? You have some indication that that just wasn't a fluke. And what you see today is uh, the breakdown that you saw in lows, which looked very compelling yesterday as we undercut the June low on a closing basis today, bouncing right back to the upside and uh, gaining about 10%. Right now it's fighting resistance on the other side around 200, it's really range bound between about 180 and uh, maybe a little more than that and uh, and 200 on the uh, on, on lows. The chart's fairly compressed because I'm bringing in the last two years of data. If you look at a one year chart, it'll make a little more color in terms of that, uh, that short-term movement there. 
But uh, Lowe's with a nice bounce today. Uh, that's not the ticker I was going to bring up. Uh, Viacom, V-I-A-C. So same thing. This is a stock that's up pretty good, but it's coming off of a fairly beaten down level. So the, the challenge with a lot of these uh, stocks, these are not leadership names that are continuing to push higher. These are some stocks that have actually been beaten down a little bit, bouncing higher. Tesla's another one, right? It's not been an overall a fantastic chart, sort of bouncing, although it's not horrible, but still sort of more range bound, really unable to break above previous resistance today, sort of moving more to the upper other, other, other side of that. You compare that to something like Kroger's, which is actually accelerating to the upper upside, improving price, uh, improving relative strength. Uh, I just did a webcast uh, earlier this week for uh, for market misbehavior and uh, and saw the, uh, we focused on relative strength. And I think the improving relative profile on a chart like Kroger is even more impressive than the fact that the price is breaking to what's uh, new highs. Always have a keen look on the uh, relative strength line to see what sort of uh, see what sort of movement we're going to have there. A little later in today's show, after our, our guest uh, our guest discussion, we're going to uh, do a segment called Banking on Breath, where we'll take a lot more into some of the breath conditions and how they're evolving. So I'll save some of my comments for that. We'll take a quick break back with my guest, Jay Soloff. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the market activity using the power of stock charts, using data visualization to understand trends and momentum and the importance of price movements. A couple of quick comments before we get to today's guest. Uh, first off, if you have questions for us, we would love to hear from you, particularly questions that come up as you are analyzing your own charts. We're here to help point you in the right direction about technical indicators, behavioral biases, market dynamics, market history, whatever it is, we'll do our best to answer your questions. You can get them to us one of three ways, via email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com, via Twitter, at finalbarsctv, Via YouTube, just put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts channel. We would love to hear from you and answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment on Friday show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That's where you can access all of our fantastic content, wonderful guests like Jay Soloff and others, special events like The Pitch and Charting the Second Half, and great shows like The Final Bar and, uh, and the others from a great group of hosts on Stock Charts TV. Go to our website, StockChartsTV.com. You can also search on your mobile devices on the App Store for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, joining us on the show once again, Jay Soloff. Jay's the lead options analyst at Investors Alley, coming to us from the Phoenix area. Jay, welcome back. Thanks for having me, David. So uh, obviously quite the uncertain environment as, uh, as I feel like we've all been uh, dealing with today, certainly feeling some distribution. Uh, you're starting with us, uh, starting us here to, talking through the uh, a stock in the industrial sector, which is a name that, or a, a sector that certainly had been leadership coming off of it. Talk to us about Caterpillar. What are you seeing? You know, and Cat's probably been talked about quite a bit lately. There's the obvious narrative there with the infrastructure bill, right? I mean, the, this is probably the first thing people think of when they think of, you know, roads and bridges and infrastructure. But I'm actually thinking a little bit shorter term. I think that's a longer term play. Uh, shorter term, though, like last week, for instance, you get the uh, the very bearish grains report, uh, you know, which, which you could look at Caterpillar as an, as an agricultural uh, play there, or this week, or even just today, I'm looking at, you know, videos of crazy flooding. And, there, you know, there are some short term reasons why uh, you might look at something like Caterpillar. And of course, if you're uh, you know, looking at the technical side, maybe you think that this 50-day average is, is going to hold. I think I didn't see exactly where we closed today, probably slightly under that. But uh, the it, if you're looking at a short-term situation, and then whenever I think short-term, I, I think of options, right, as an options guy. But the reason I, I really brought up CAT is because I think it's a really great example of where options can can provide a lot of value for a trader looking to do a short-term trade in an expensive stock. So, you know, this is a 200, you know, let's just say $200 stock, you know, you want to buy a hundred shares of it, you know, it's $20,000 out of your, out of your pocket, right? That's not necessarily the capital that, that people are, you know, slinging around if, if they want to, you know, get it, get exposure to something. So this is where I really think options can be powerful. So I wanted to show a couple different ways that you could use options depending on your level of, uh, 
of experience and, and, you know, risk-taking. That's perfect. Uh, you actually shared with us sort of the option table, sort of laying out the framework of how we could potentially go about this. How would you look at this? What, what would you be thinking? Yeah. So th this is the thing about options, right? There's so many things you can do with them. So the most basic thing, like, you know, let's just say I want to take a month. So we're looking at the seventh, uh, September 10th, which is, which is a little over three weeks. And, and, uh, now, normally, I, I would look at a 30-day option, so September 17th. However, uh, that uh, being a monthly option, they didn't have the increments by five. They had increments by 10 and mm -hmm. didn't really think that that uh, it wasn't flexible. And <laughs> I wanted to have a few more choices. So, so we're looking at a little quicker than uh, we're looking at about three, three and a half weeks. And if you wanted to, let's say, take, all right, I think it's going to bounce off that 50-day moving average. I think the you know, the, the grain report, the, you know, the damage happening to, you know, across the country is going to, you know, cause a, uh, you know, an uptick in the, in this thing, people are going to start buying equipment and I, I want to take advantage of that. So you might look at, um, we'll use, uh, we'll use the 210 here as the, at the money, uh, you might just look at that straight call and, and it's about a $7 option. Now that's still pretty expensive. That's about, that's about $700 to, you know, gain you know, control essentially of a hundred shares, a lot cheaper than 20,000, <laughs> but obviously you only have it for three weeks. Um, but this is where I think, you know, having experience with options can, can really help. Now let's say, all right, well, I think it might bounce. I don't think it's going to new highs or anything like that. I really don't want to spend $700 for three weeks. So maybe I'll do the, the vertical spread, the call spread where you're buying the 210 and you're selling the 215. You know, now you're suddenly talking about a two and a half dollar trade instead of a seven dollar trade. Now you're capped at three and a half dollars, but hey, you know, you spend two and a half and you make three and a half. You know, that's well over a hundred percent gain, and, and that's a you know, that's a nice trade. So mm -hmm. something like that could be a very good way to play a much more expensive stock like cat. And finally, if you're more advanced and and you, know, you have a higher option trading permission, you might look at this and say, you know what, cat, and this is the trade I, I, you know, I really like it, it, cat, I think has this floor, right? It's this great infrastructure play. There's, there's, you know, there, there's a really good chance that this company is speaking a lot of government orders over the next, however many years. Right. And so you might say, you know, I think there's a floor. I I'm willing to sell a put below here because I think, you know, puts are, uh, I don't mind if it gets down there. I'm, I'm perfectly happy buying shares at whatever, you know, let's just say 200. And, mm. uh, and, you know, meanwhile, puts are generally expensive. People use them for, for hedging. So they're, they're kind of expensive. So I can sell, let's say the 200 put for a dollar 40. Let's just round up to say dollar 50 to make math easy. Then you buy that 210, 215 call spread. And now you're paying a dollar for it. It was originally 250. Now you're paying a dollar. Let's like said if we if we sell the put for a dollar fifty, so now you're spending you know a hundred bucks to get to with the chance to make four hundred, and of course your risk is you get assigned on the shares and you, you get long the stock at two hundred if it drops there. But again, we're talking about a three week trade, so that would you know we need a pretty decent sell off for that to happen. So that's the sort of thing I really like with options is that you can kind of pick and choose depending on what your your risk level is and uh, how much real capital you want to lay out and. And, and, you know, and it's really good if you mix it with technical analysis, because then you can start looking at where you think the stock will go to and then, you know, support resistance levels and kind of set your strikes at those levels. Jay, that was beautifully said. I really appreciate you talking that through with us and, and thinking about the chart, thinking of the potential bounce off the 50 day and how you might apply that uh, sort of technical uh, insight using, uh, using options. Listen, it was awesome to have you back on. Really appreciate it. Stay safe. Be well. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Dave. That's Jay Soloff. Jay's the lead options analyst at Investors Alley. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm fascinated talking with guys like Jay. I think for uh, equity derivatives, options for some investors seems very challenging because there's a whole different language, whole way of thinking of it. But I hope what you got just from that little uh, slice of, uh, of discussion with, uh, with Jay, sort of the potential, right? Depending on how aggressive you want to be, depending on how, you know, what your risk assessment is, you can layer in some different options uh, strategies to make it, uh, you know, to really bet on a particular uh, outcome that you see as, uh, as most probable. Really well done. And I love the, uh, the relationship of the chart to the option chain there. 
Let's continue on with our next segment called Banking on Breadth. Uh, what we love to do uh, regularly is focus on breadth indicators. Uh, today, we're actually going to focus a little more depth than normal on uh, the breadth, uh, the breadth environment and what it tells us. You know, we've talked about this stealth correction is how I've described this market really since April uh, and how that's evolved. And I and I call it a stealth correction because for me, a correction uh, can have three forms, either a price correction, meaning we, we sell off in a you know significant amount of time. And I would say the uh, you know, S&P back in um, uh, February, March of 2020 is a, is a great example of a price correction. You then have a time correction, which is what you might call September and October of 2020. We really didn't lose a lot of headway in terms of, uh, of price level, but it was more of a consolidation, right? It was a two month uh, sort of pause before we continued on. The third one is the sneakiest, which is called the stealth correction, which is the market, the index actually goes higher, but depending on what your portfolio looks like, your portfolio is really getting hurt. And so think about, the last couple of months, if you own small caps, on average, you're having a pretty tough time with this market, even though the S&P keeps going higher. It's super annoying and, uh, and challenging. So let's look at the breadth conditions and how that illustrates what we're seeing with uh, what I call the stealth correction. First off is this chart we refer to often, which is looking at the cumulative advanced decline lines for the New York Stock Exchange, for the S&P 500, the mid cap index, and the small cap index. I've color coded these very subjectively, just showing the overall trends or how I see those trends evolving. In green here, we have the advanced decline line on the S&P 500, making new highs basically every month uh, in 2021, really going back to last October. You continue to see higher highs in this breadth line. And that tells you that the large caps, really the mega caps, have been just fine in terms of their overall participation in the subtrend. However, if you look at the other cap tiers, you can see it's not nearly as attractive. Most of the other, actually all of the other uh, advanced decline lines actually made their peak in early June. From there, they've actually been in a downtrend, making lower peaks as the market's gone higher. So June, July, August, the S&P keeps making new all-time highs, but mo all of those other advanced decline lines are lower now than they were in June. Uh, when we were making uh, all-time highs there. Most of those are below their 50-day moving average. This is updated as of uh, as of third, uh, excuse me, as of Tuesday's close. Not yet for today, so expect these to go down even further when we digest uh, the uh, the action in today's trading. So overall, this is certainly indicating a negative breadth environment, right? The prices uh, or the, the stocks that comprise those indexes actually going lower. This is a really interesting one looking at the advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange versus the NASDAQ. You can see the breadth on the NASDAQ is actually really bad. If you think the other ones are breaking down or, or not confirming, they have a non-confirmation, the NASDAQ advanced decline line is actually breaking down. Now, I don't refer to the, the AD line for the NASDAQ only because if you go to the less in, uh, less compelling names in the NASDAQ, there's a lot of, to put not, you know, lack of a better term, there's a lot of junk in the NASDAQ, so especially the worst performing uh, part of it. So the AD line is usually a lot more negative on the NASDAQ. It's not necessarily a sign of, uh, of, uh, of market uh, um um, instability. It's more just represents how the NASDAQ has a lot of junky stuff in it when you get below the, the really uh, impressive uh, mega cap names we probably know. But for what it's worth, the NASDAQ uh, 80 line breaking down. In terms of advancers, decliners today, just looking at price on its own, over 70% of uh, the New York Stock Exchange closing lower, and that's pretty similar to what it was on Tuesday, um, You know, which means about a quarter of, uh, of the New York Stock Exchange issues uh, or up on the day. Uh, so that's, you know, certainly more of a negative uh, trend. 80% up days or down days are the real significant ones. That's when you have a, a real piling in on one side or the other. 90% days are, are super rare, but very important. This is an indicator uh, some of you may not be familiar with. This is actually based, based on Walter Deemer's work. He likes to look at the AD lines, but using volume. So he actually created this indicator, which tells you what percent of the uh, of the volume uh, was on advancers versus uh, versus decliners, and so this being at twenty five percent, so twenty five percent of the advancing volume was in uh, was in um, uh, advancers, seventy five percent of it uh, in decliners, and uh, you know low reading there, especially a ninety percent down day or a ninety percent up day, again incredibly rare, but really tells you there's a a washout of sorts or a, a real capitulation where everything's on one side of the coin or the other. We've been looking at this for a while, this chart, and we've been talking about the percent of S&P stocks above their 50-day moving average. It's holding steady in the low 60% uh, range. It was actually in the upper 60% range uh, in the last couple of days. Uh, this is up from about 32% uh, about uh, two months ago. In mid-June, it was uh, only one in three S&P names above their 50-day uh, moving average. Now it's back up to about two in three. 
What's interesting, though, uh, more to me is the chart on the top. This is the percent of S&P stocks above their 200-day moving average. So it's actually rolling down. It's gone down to about 82%. This is down from you know around 95, 90 uh, plus percent back in April. And it was uh, just recently around 90% at the end of July. It's rolling over and it's threatening to be at the lowest level that it was since this last time correction back in September and October of 2020. So it's actually incredibly low relative to where it's been. This has been incredibly high as most stocks have just held their 200 day. If you, if you think of charts like, Disney and others that are actually breaking their 200-day moving average or testing their 200-day moving average right now. That's why that indicator is actually starting to break down a little bit. Unhealthy if that continues to go much lower than what we're at, um, especially below 70 percent is sort of my uh, back of the envelope line to watch there. You know, this is uh, stocks making new highs and new lows. You can see for the S&P 500, again, very few stocks making new 52-week lows. And I think that's more a function of how far the 52-week low is for the average large cap stock, right? We're still pretty far above where we were one year ago. Now, having said that, there are certain stocks that are actually right at where they were a year plus ago. It's things like Netflix and Amazon are right literally at the same level they were a year uh, a year ago, right? Last August, uh, even last July, they're right about at the same level. So there are stocks that are certainly going to be able to make a new 52-week low. Uh, you can see on the New York Stock Exchange, you're actually getting an increasing number of new lows. It's actually the lowest it's been since last year in September and October. You're seeing plenty of new lows in the NASDAQ. And again, I think it's, that's a function less of really negative breadth than more about the fact that uh, there's a lot of uh, you know, junky stuff on the NASDAQ. But it's worth noting that this is the lowest level that it's been almost in the last 12 months uh, plus. Here, I'm actually taking the new lows and magnifying them a little bit because we've had so many consistent new highs. The little red bars here, kind of hard to see. So I broke it out as its own series and you can see a little more clearly how we're very similar to where we were uh, back here in uh, last September and, uh, and last October. The last thing I'll point out is the bullish percent index on the S&P 500 remaining below 70%. I think that's key. Uh, we, it's called a bear alert when it's above 70% and breaks back below it. If we had broken above the 70% uh, bullish percent line, I think that tells you that enough, stock, enough stocks are recovering to push their point and figure charts back into bullish territory. Not having it this week with the uh, bullish percent index remaining below 70%. Look for that to continue lower today. Folks, that is our show. We need to wrap it up by looking at the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. In our segment, Banking on Breath, we talk about the S&P, breadth uh, uh, using bullish percent indexes. Here we're looking at the bullish percent on the healthcare index, which just broke back above, uh, above 70%. The bullish percent index on technology, which just broke below 70%, giving a bear alert. And the energy sector breaking below 30%, which is a confirmed uh, bearish trend. So basically, you have energy confirmed in a downtrend using the bullish percent. Technology just giving a bear alert, indicating that things are starting to get a little uncomfortable in terms of overall breadth. And you have healthcare breaking above 70%. When you talk about the benefit of going, uh, you know, looking opportunistically when it, within healthcare, this is showing you how that sector is standing out from some of its, uh, some of the other sectors. Chart number two, Target. So we have a bunch of big box retailers and other retailers reporting earnings this week. Target coming off today just under 3%, testing its 50-day moving average here. A lot of stocks have been holding their 50-day. Many have been failing there. When I look at this market and I think about the potential for downside, this certainly looks distributive with a move to the upside. They always say the market takes the stairs higher and the elevator downwards. It's certainly been taking the elevator down in the last week. You can see the RSI is breaking below 40, uh, which is certainly an area of, uh, of concern. So this stock going from overbought and in a nice solid uptrend to testing its 50-day, I think is concerning. It doesn't hold that through this week. I think that's uh, certainly a negative sign for Target and just broadly for, uh, for retail. NVIDIA, another stock reporting earnings uh, this week, just breaking down through its 50-day moving average today, down 2%. I would keep an eye on this one because semiconductors are certainly a bellwether group to pay attention to. You want that group to do well if you're bullish overall for the uh, big picture for equities. Folks, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Jay Sola from Investors Alley, joining us from the Phoenix area, sharing a particular options trade with us. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.